Hello again and welcome back to my kitchen. So another week goes by, another strange week in this strange world in which we now find ourselves. Uh, I don't know how you're getting on but I'm finding it very strange. Um, our, as a family we haven't been so well so actually we've been in isolation for a while and it was only earlier this week that I got to venture out to see what life outside of my hedge looked like. Um, certainly we are feeling a lot better now than we have been. No idea if we've had the virus certainly had something nasty um, but yes we're in a better place now I'm glad to say but I know a lot of you are struggling too I know some of you have had what could well be the coronavirus some of you are just struggling with ongoing medical conditions that well it's harder to get treatment for at the moment I know and it's a really hard time for a lot of people so um, yes if you're ill get well soon so today is Palm Sunday and again, it's strange that we can't meet together in church to celebrate Palm Sunday like we usually do. Um, but our theme is going to be the coronavirus and the king. Why doesn't Jesus do something? Uh, but more about that in a moment. Um, after which, of course, we'll also have some prayers. And I'm glad to say Robin is going to be joining us to lead our prayers this week. So, as I said, our theme for today is the coronavirus and the king. Why doesn't Jesus just do something? Well, that's one of those questions that gets thrown up every now and again, isn't it? You've probably come across this question, maybe in different forms, from people you know, maybe friends, relatives. It's that question that really is, how can a good God allow suffering? And of course, sometimes people just ask it because they're trying to be awkward. They're trying to get out of having to believe in God. And so they think this is a clever question that gets them off the hook. We, you know, the sort of the armchair philosopher who likes to think about these things from their armchair and gives them excuses not to become a Christian. But we're not in a place like that at the moment. This isn't just a theoretical discussion. This is a real situation. There is a genuine threat to the human race. People are dying at alarming rates. And uh, for some of us, it's getting pretty real, particularly as we hear of those who we love who are really seriously in danger. We don't just need a clever answer. We need a real answer. A real answer that helps us understand more about Jesus and more about what it means to follow him today. So where are we going to look for this answer? Um, I suppose we could look at all the references to the coronavirus in the scriptures. That would be a good place to start, but it doesn't take long because, of course, there are no references to the coronavirus in the Bible. So we're going to have to start somewhere else. In our exploration to understand this. Why doesn't Jesus do something? That is a really good question and to explore it I think it would help to look at how Jesus dealt with people when he walked on earth in first century Israel because of course there were lots of sick people then as well, people who needed help they didn't have the same sort of health care that we have these days and people would have died at a much younger age. So how did Jesus behave and relate to them? Well, we could look at the early chapters of Mark's Gospel. I'm just going to read now from Mark chapter 1. I've got here Mark chapter 1 and I'm going to read from verse 33. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. I think we should really be comforted by seeing Jesus caring for people here. When he comes across sick people, he really cares. He doesn't walk by on the other side. He, he wants to know. He wants to show compassion. He heals. Jesus really cares about people in their sickness. And I hope that's real comfort to you at this time. But you may have also been intrigued by the word that Jesus used, um, well, that Mark used when talking about Jesus. He said, Jesus healed many. It doesn't say he healed everyone. 
just that he healed many. Now why is that? Why didn't Jesus heal everyone? Oh, why is it he left that place? Why is it he moved on to other places and he left people behind? I guess probably the day after he left, somebody in the village would have gone down poorly and yet it was too late. Jesus had left. Why had he moved on? What was so important that took him on and kept him from just a healing ministry in that village? Why didn't Jesus heal everyone? Uh, of course, it may be that you are wondering the same thing yourself. It may be that you're thinking, well, I've prayed for people before and sometimes, amazingly, a miracle happens and someone is healed and praise the Lord when that happens. And yet there are other times when we pray and there doesn't seem to be any response. The person isn't healed. Well, why is that? I think it's the same issue that's connected here. And I think to understand it, we need to understand what drew Jesus away from that healing ministry in that village. What took him away from there? And to explore what on earth could be so important as to take him away from a healing ministry. I'd like to turn to a bit of the Bible later in Mark's Gospel, Mark chapter 11. And it probably won't surprise you that we're actually going to look at the triumphal entry, given that today is Palm Sunday. And that is what traditionally we remember a week before Easter Day, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem and was greeted by crowds cheering. And that's where we're going to turn for our Bible reading now. Hello everyone. The reading this morning is from Mark chapter 11 verses 1 to 11 and I'm going to be reading from the New International Version of the Bible. So Mark chapter 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and just as you enter it you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. It must have been a pretty amazing moment with all the crowds cheering as Jesus entered Jerusalem. It reminds me of a few years ago when we had the wedding of Prince William and Kate, the uh, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Uh, you probably remember how they went for a drive in a sports car, an open top sports car, and everybody was lining the streets and waving flags and celebrating as they drove by. Well, this is Jesus's triumphal procession. The difference is he's not in a sports car obviously, but he's not in the first century equivalent either, which I guess probably would be some sort of war horse. No, he's just on a donkey. It gives us a hint, doesn't it, already that he's not your average king, that he's coming in humility, that he's coming perhaps to serve. We know he loves to serve and care for people. We've seen that in how he cared for those who were sick, and diseased and how he healed them and as he comes into Jerusalem we get that hint that he's coming again to serve but how 
Well, more clues come in the words that he used. Um, so the crowd sh shout, Hosanna! Now, Hosanna is uh, one of those words that is a Greek word. Uh, it simply means rescue or save. It shows that they understood that Jesus was God's chosen king, that he'd come for a special job to help them. Now, if you've heard this passage preached on before, you may have heard the suggestion that those people perhaps didn't understand why Jesus had come. Perhaps they thought they needed rescuing from the Romans. And of course, that was a big issue in those days. They were occupied by Roman forces. Everywhere they turned, to the right, to the left, they would see evidence that the Romans were oppressing them. It was everywhere. Wasn't it obvious that they needed saving from the Romans? Perhaps they thought that's what Jesus was coming to do for them. But of course, it wasn't. It may be what they thought they needed, but Jesus had a bigger plan, a grander plan. If you've ever been to a great celebration with crowds present or maybe a sporting event, then you'll know how easy it is to get caught up in the excitement of cheering for someone or for a team. I guess it must have felt like that as the crowds erupted with excitement as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. I wonder how many of them actually grasped what Jesus had come to do. It's easy to assume that most of them thought he'd come to kick out the Romans. That was, after all, the big thing at that time. But, of course, Jesus had a grander plan than that. A grander plan than just ridding Israel of the Romans. A grander plan even than ridding Israel of sickness. And this plan all began that weekend as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, a place of deep significance. Where that week something monumentous would happen. It started with the crowds cheering for him. It ended with the crowds shouting, crucify him. And of course he died. But his death wasn't a mistake. It was all part of the plan, God's plan, that Jesus was fully a part of. In fact, Jesus explained it to his disciples in the chapter before. So if I turn to chapter 10 and I read verse 45... It says, Jesus said of himself, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That is the key to what Jesus came to do. So what is our biggest problem? In God's eyes, the fear of being occupied by an invading force like the Romans, or even the attack of a virus like the coronavirus. They're big problems, but they're not our biggest problem. Uh, they seem like a huge problem, don't they? You can't turn anywhere these days looking at the news. The coronavirus is everywhere. You head out, and even if you go to the shops, you're treated with suspicion. It feels like what we really need now is someone to rescue us from the coronavirus. But Jesus recognises that we've actually got a bigger problem. Our problem is not what happens before we die. Our problem is what happens after we die. It's what the Bible calls Judgment Day. But the good news is that Jesus has a solution for this. And that's what he was explaining as he spoke to his disciples when he read those words, uh, uh, when he said that he gave his life as a ransom for many. His death on the cross was a payment, a payment offered on our behalf, a payment to free us from the cords of death so that we're no longer trapped by the sin, the way we've turned away from God, which condemns us and which judges us. A payment to release us from hell so that we can enjoy heaven, 
It's a wonderful gift by our Lord Jesus Christ, who has offered this to all who turn to him in faith and trust that they might be free after death to enjoy the wonders and the joys of the kingdom of his heavenly father, where we might live forever and enjoy God's company forever. So, why doesn't Jesus do something? Well, the answer to that question is, of course, he has. He has done something. We might, in our own minds, imagine that we would love to see him just stop the coronavirus in its tracks. That might be our solution. But actually, Jesus has a grander plan. A grander plan. Not just to delay death, but to give us eternal life. So as we think about the coronavirus, I think it's helpful to return to first century Israel to see Jesus. He cares so deeply about those who are sick. It's not that they don't matter to him. They're very special and precious to him. Deeply precious. And he will heal some. I genuinely believe that. So we need to pray. Pray for people who are sick. Pray that Jesus would miraculously heal them. But then let's also not forget that he's got a grander plan. He doesn't just want to delay their death. He wants to give them eternal life. And sadly, there are some people we know who don't yet understand that, who haven't realised that there is a ransom due and that Jesus offers to pay that ransom for them by his death on the cross. Let's pray too that they would come to know Jesus. And of course, then they'll get to understand more about his glorious eternal kingdom in the new heavens and the new earth, a place where there will be no more sickness, where disease no longer exists. So yes, Jesus has done something. Jesus has done something glorious, far beyond perhaps what we might want, something far better, far greater, far more wonderful for us all. So as we head into what is known as Holy Week in the run-up to Easter, we're not likely to escape the news about the coronavirus. I think it's going to continue to be a big problem, not just for this week, but for many weeks to come. But as we do head into this week, I think it might help to remember that the coronavirus is not in charge. Um, You probably know that the word corona comes from the Latin word for crown, because of this idea that the coronavirus has an edge to it, that when you look under the microscope, you can see it's got like a crown around it. But the truth is the coronavirus is not the king. There is only one true king, and that's Jesus. And the coronavirus cannot take away from you what is yours in Jesus, your forgiveness and your eternal life. In fact, Jesus is the true king, but oddly enough, he never wore a crown. Although that's not quite true. There was one crown he did wear. Of course, that was the crown of thorns, which he wore on Good Friday as he died. So perhaps this week I could encourage you to reflect on that crown that Jesus wore, that corona. To remember who is the real king and that the real king is Jesus. And that that would encourage you, I hope, as I hope it would encourage us all in this time of Easter, as we just remember that we have a true king, the Lord Jesus, who wore the crown of thorns, who is the true king, but who gave his life as a ransom for mine, for my life, as a ransom for your life, because he wanted you to be there with him in the glories of heaven. Shall we pray? A wonderful, a loving, heavenly Father, we deserve nothing from you, and yet you give us grace and love and mercy. Thank you for sending Jesus that though we don't deserve it, he saved us from our biggest problem. At this time of the coronavirus, we do pray for those who are poorly. We pray more than just death being delayed. We pray for people to be saved and to know Jesus 
and to know eternal life through him. Help us this week to remember who really wears the crown, that it's Jesus, that we might bow the knee and worship him. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The treasurer of one of the churches at which I had been vicar was also a good calligrapher and he presented me with this text taken from Psalm 46. The well-known phrase, be still and know that I am God. Particularly appropriate in these times of uncertainty and anxiety. In a few moments I'll be leading us in a time of prayer and there'll be one or two pauses during that prayer within which you might find it helpful just to glance up afresh because the text will be kept on the screen. Father, we thank you for the creation of this wonderful world in all its complexity and detail. We thank you for the gift of life and the means of sustenance through all the generations. And yet we confess that we rarely give you the glory and have sought to live life in our own ways. In this holy week, we are reminded again that you sought to bring us back to yourself and at such a cost. And on that Palm Sunday, your Son, our Lord, rode into the opposition of those whose ideas of comfort and security were being threatened. And how even those who were well-meaning misunderstood really everything. Yet with them, we proclaim, Hosanna, Lord, save us. Father, we pray for our world, where competition and suspicion between nations and within nations have been overtaken by our facing a common threat brought on by this virus. Direct those who are seeking to understand and then to counteract this threat. Grant to each nation wisdom to their leaders to know how best to implement effective measures for their people and increase and strengthen medical and backup resources to each. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for our National Health Service and the efforts being put in by so many on our behalf. We pray for those who feel vulnerable in their own place of work, for those who feel tired through their efforts and those who feel frustrated through being unable to work through their own being isolated. We pray too for others who work in other caring professions, whether in the residential homes or other areas of outreach. Thank you too for the many volunteers who through their services are able to be a blessing to others. We pray too for those whose decisions affect the lives of others, whether as employers or in the financial sector, that they may think and work selflessly and for the greater good. We pray too for those charities whose regular work will be hampered through reduced income. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray too for those suffering or anxious now, for those who are ill and those caring for them, for those for whom isolation is oppressive, for those without a home to call their own, for those who fear unemployment, for those whose educational future may be at risk that in casting their care on you, they may know your power to renew and to transform. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for all the churches in their newly developing areas of ministry, the Holy Trinity, and in our own lives, may we know in a deeper reality that we are your people and that you are our God. Amen. And we now join together in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and for ever. Amen. So I thought I'd say goodbye to you from my garden. Thank you for joining us this week. As we head into Holy Week, I hope you'll join us again. We've got meditations each day, Monday to Thursday you'll have uh, Caroline and Trevor and myself and Ruth leading meditations that will release in the same way. On Friday, a meditation led by Robin as we reflect on the day on which Jesus died. And then of course a great celebration, Easter Day, when we'll um, celebrate the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ is alive and reigning. I don't know what this week will hold for you, or whatever, we will keep praying for each other and as last week, same advice, uh, keep safe, keep praying and keep connected. Bye bye.